Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd Seminary. This podcast is dedicated to discussing issues related to scripture and theology. For more information, visit petergaiman.com. Well, let me give you a very hearty hello. I'm not sure you've ever received a hearty hello before, but I will give it. And I'm excited for today's episode. Today we are going to talk about when and what is the kingdom. When and what is the kingdom. And here's why I want to talk about that. It's an important issue because obviously the Bible talks a lot about the kingdom. And in fact, some individuals have pointed out, and I think rightfully so, that this seems to be the central theme of Scripture, the expectation of kingdom, God ruling, and exactly what does that look like. I think that this is a very important aspect to think about. And when we get kingdom thinking correct, when we understand what the kingdom is and how we relate to the kingdom, how Israel relates to the kingdom, then a lot of Bible passages fall into place naturally. Not saying there are no complications, but I think it does help to be able to organize your thinking around this theme, and other people have observed that too. For for example, uh, the Garden of Eden itself, the way it's portrayed in Scripture, Scripture seems to be moving toward a return to the Garden of Eden. So the idea of a kingdom is, in theological circles, often described as the return to the Garden of Eden or the return to the Edenic state. And that seems to be accurate because you have God associating with, fellowshipping deep, deeply without any sin, uh fully with humanity, and the kingdom also is a return to that communal state with God and man dwelling together uh, on this earth. So that is definitely a important priority. Also, if we study the kingdom and what that is and when that is, we also understand what our future expectations should be. What's the future going to look like? How should we understand eschatology? All these things start to fall in place if we understand how the Bible defines kingdom and how it portrays it and looks forward to that. And then finally, there are probably other ideas as well as why this is important to study, but I was just thinking about this. And the third one would be that it solidifies our understanding of a distinction between the Israel and the church. There are certain promises that are given to the people of Israel and I know oftentimes we kind of broad brush those or, or pave over those in a variety of ways. But if we understand how the scripture talks about the kingdom of God and what our expectation is of that time period, it's very hard not to see there being a distinction between Israel and the church. And then that, seeing the distinction between Israel and the church, has tremendous ramifications even for our expectation of what, how the church is to function, whether or not we are to act like Israel and or whether there's an expectation that the church has a distinct identity and that plays into how we even uh, do our everyday ecclesiology. And so there are ramifications of this theology of the kingdom which which are potent and so it behooves us as it were to uh, study this and think through these issues. So the way I want to do this is to start off, I want to start in the New Testament with Jesus, and then I want to go back and define it in the Old Testament. Normally I like to work progressively uh, because that's how scripture defines things, and there's progressive revelation, and we define things initially in the Old Testament and work toward the New Testament. But I want to point out, uh, just as a starting point, that Jesus himself taught that there was going to be a a distinction, a period of time between the absence of the Son of Man and then the coming of the kingdom. And we see that in multiple places, but Luke 19 is probably one of the uh, easiest places to see that. So Jesus had just been talking with Zacchaeus, been talking to him about forgiveness and about the Son of Man coming to seek and save the lost. And then in verse 11 of Luke 19, we are told that as the people heard these things, he, that that's Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. 
So in other words, in verse 11, Luke is just front-loading why Jesus is going to tell this parable. And he's saying that Jesus was telling this parable because these people thought that because Jesus was going to Jerusalem, that the kingdom of God was going to come. Because Jesus, many people believed, was the Messiah. And as the Messiah, when he was in Jerusalem, he would institute the kingdom of God. But Jesus tells this parable to correct that notion, saying the kingdom of God will not appear immediately. And so he gives this parable, uh, and it's uh, semi-well-known, so I won't read the whole thing, but it's about a nobleman who goes into a far country to receive a kingdom for himself. So in other words, this individual has to go off, which was pretty well known in that uh, time period with the Roman Empire. You would have uh, certain kings who would have to go to Rome to talk to the emperor there to uh, achieve some sort of uh, status whereby he could claim a kingdom for himself within the magisterial kingdom of Rome. And so this was a common idea where someone would have to go off to receive the kingdom and then come back and institute that kingdom. And so while the nobleman is gone, he calls uh, his servants together and he gives them 10 minus and says to them, engage in, in business until I come. And so he gives them a stewardship basically. And so when he returned in verse 15, this is of Luke 19, Having received the kingdom, he ordered those servants whom he had given the money to be called to the, to him that he might know what they gained. So as he evaluates them, he, he rewards them in, to compensate for their faithfulness. So the ones who had been faithful in much, he gives much. The ones who had been faithful in little, little corresponding to that. So the one who had made 10 minus more in verse 16, in verse 17, he has 10 cities, which he has authority over. That's, that's his reward. And so, so on and so forth. He rewards them, uh, as they have been faithful to him. And in verse 27, those who had opposed his kingdom, those who, who did not want him to rule, he brings them to him and slaughters them. So this is a pretty apt picture of when Christ is going to return. He's going to reward his, his faithful ones here, give them authority within the kingdom, uh, over cities and administrative duties. And those who have opposed him, he's going to slaughter. So the reason I bring up this parable is because Jesus is actually specifying here that there's going to be a delay. The, the son of man is going to go away to receive the kingdom and come back and institute it. And so there is a correlation here, an expectation that even Jesus is giving to us where there's going to be a delay of the kingdom. So, I would say just at the outset, if our initial question is, when is the kingdom of God going to be? Well, Jesus is giving us indication here that there's going to be a delay in when the kingdom of God appears. So that's, I think, the initial step jumping off point uh, would be helpful there if we're trying to define it that way. Now, we don't, wouldn't have to start there. We could start in the Old Testament. That's where I want to direct our attention now. When we think through the Old Testament definition of kingdom expectation, obviously, even in the book of Genesis, you have the idea, Genesis 17, Genesis 35, where you have the promise that kings are going to come from Abraham's line. So in other words, there's always been a royal expectation. You have Genesis 49, where it says the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So there are royal expectations even built into the early pictures of Genesis, these pages of Genesis where uh, you understand, okay, even within God's plan early on, there was always an expectation of king and kingdom. And so that's part of, even built into the Mosaic law, I should say, in Deuteronomy 17, you have the law of the king. At that point, there was no king. Israel was just being developed as a nation uh, they had just finished their wilderness wandering. Forty years earlier, they really had been solidified as a nation at Mount Sinai. But there was still even then an expectation of a king. Now, when we think of this idea of, okay, so there is an expectation of a king that's going to rule over this nation. Well, what what is the future of Israel going to look like and how does that relate to the king itself, their their idea of being in the land, having a kingdom. And there is lots 
of indication early on in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, that Israel was going to fail and they were going to go into exile. So there's a couple passages that teach this rather explicitly. Deuteronomy 4 is a major one. I've done uh, quite a bit of work in verses 25 through 30. Uh, I've written some articles on that. I think I have an older podcast that goes into detail on this passage. But in verse 25, it says, When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, dot, 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 he goes on to say he calls heaven to earth to witness against them that they are going to be utterly uh, kicked out of the land. They are going to be punished for that. But one of the things I want to point out is that in verse 25, this is a temporal expectation. So in other words, this isn't just a conditional idea saying, if this happens, then this will happen. This is actually, I would, I would call it a prophetic statement by Moses saying, when you father children and children's children, when you are developing in the land, this is what's going to happen. You are going to act corruptly. You're going to rebel against God. And then in verse 27, he promises the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will also serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. So in other words, this is what's going to happen, Israel. You will fail the Lord. You will seek other gods and God will send you in exile. But this is the most important part of the passage because it doesn't end there. Verse 29 and 30 say, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him uh, if you search for after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Really that should be translated for you will search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Meaning that this is the expectation. The reason that Israel is going to seek the Lord is because their hearts are going to be changed and they are going to seek Yahweh. And then verse 30 actually makes this explicit, and it gives another temporal phrase there saying, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. So again, it talks about this is a firm expectation when this takes place, all these things which I've talked about come upon you, and notice he gives a time period where this is going to take place in the latter days. Okay, this is a very key phrase in the Old Testament. The latter days is an expectation. It's a eschatological time frame. It's not just saying at a later date. It's saying in the latter days, at, in, the, in the final stages, if you will. That's, that's a key phrase here. Then you're going to return to the Lord your God and obey, obey his voice. So key in on that phrase, latter days, because basically what Deuteronomy 4 is talking about here is that there's going to be a exile for the people of Israel, but an ultimate restoration of the people of Israel, uh, as is foretold in Deuteronomy uh, 4. But also, that's not, you might say, well, that's the only passage. No, there, there are other passages. Uh, maybe we'll just stop by Deuteronomy 30 as well, because Deuteronomy 30 is the first an initial mention of what becomes known as the New Covenant. So in Deuteronomy 30, you have uh, a very strong indication of a future restoration for Israel, and it's linked with the New Covenant language of the circumcision of the heart. So in verse 1 of chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, it says, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse. So in other words, He's talking to Israel here, obviously, and he says, you're going to go, you're going to receive some of the blessings of this covenant because you're going to have partial obedience, but you're ultimately going to turn your back on God and the curse is going to come upon you. And you are going to call this to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. So in other words, Moses is basically just... uh, it's a foregone conclusion that Israel is going to go through this. They are going to be in exile. Remember, this is even before Israel enters the land of Canaan. And Moses is prophesying that Israel is going to rebel against God, be sent into exile. And then in exile, the people of Israel are going to call this to mind. And in verse 2, they will return to the Lord your God, you and your children. You're going to obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the Lord's going to restore your fortunes, have mercy. He will gather you, bring you back into the land. All of that's promised. Well, you might say, well, how is that going to happen? 
Well, verse 6 is the center of this passage, and a lot of people have observed that this forms a chiasm, meaning verse 6 is the key to all of it. So in verse 6 it says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So in other words, what he's saying there in chapter 30, verse 6, is that God is going to take action. He's going to, if, if we want to use theological terms, he's going to regenerate your heart. He's going to circumcise your heart. And notice also it's the heart of your offspring. So in other words, this isn't going to be just a one generational thing. This is going to be something where the entire people of Israel are completely circumcised in heart, regenerated, obeying God. And that's going to bring about a tremendous change in the national uh, existence of Israel, obviously. And so like Deuteronomy 30 says, God's going to bring them back together in the nation. This is going to be a great and glorious time for the people of Israel. Now, that gives us a expectation immediately at the very outset of biblical history, even before Israel enters the land, that they are going to fail as a nation. But that's not going to be the end because God already promises early on that he's going to restore them as a nation. So that's why, I, you know, I, I'm going to front load things a little bit here in the sense that, you know, people always get on, uh, you know, me or others who think like me because they, they say, oh, you premillennialists who hold to a kingdom for Israel or whatever, you are only basing that on Revelation 20 or something like that. Well, no. Really, the expectation for Israel having distinct promises of restoration comes from the Old Testament like this. And so we think through this aspect of this latter days scenario where God has promised that there is going to come a restoration for Israel. I mean, certainly the curse has come, right? Nobody could argue against that. Israel did go into exile. So now, why are we so hesitant to embrace the fact that the Bible also says there's going to come a great restoration in line with the new covenant, in line with this promise of regeneration and restoration? Well, there are other passages which flesh this out, so it's not just an isolated incident. Now, you remember the phrase, the latter days. Well, Isaiah 2 picks up on that phrase. And so in Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, he links this time period, this restoration of the people of Israel, with the kingdom of God. Okay, so we've already started to define what the, what the future history of Israel is going to look like. Deuteronomy is very explicit that you're going to have exile and then you're going to have a restoration of some kind. Well, Isaiah puts that within the realm of kingdom. So Isaiah 2 Verses 2 to 4, he says, it shall come to pass in the latter days. So again, time for, time period here. Latter days, right? This is the, the neon light flashing element saying, okay, time period wise, this is what's going to happen in the latter days. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills. All the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion, that is Jerusalem, shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He, that is the Lord, shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now notice what is said here. This, this can't be the eternal state as we often talk about it because sin is actually talked about. Uh, the Lord is actually going to decide disputes between the peoples. How could there be dispute if there is no sin, if there's complete agreement, if there's if there's perfection, there there would be no dispute with regard to that. So the the picture here is that there's going to come a time in the latter days. When is that? Well, we already talked about that in Deuteronomy. There's already a definition building there. So as we are seeing this developed, he's saying during this time period, we are going to see the kingdom established. People are going to flow to Jerusalem. The Lord is going to be reigning from Jerusalem. He's going to be deciding the disputes between the peoples. And there's not even going to be war during this time because of the Lord's leadership and because of his 
uh, implementation of peace and prosperity. So there's not going to be any war during this time, during this kingdom reign. Now, that's, again, a uh, just a small passage, but it gives us more insight into what we expect during the latter days. There's also another important element to this, too, with regard to the king, and Hosea 3 picks this up. So Hosea and Isaiah have some overlap here, and they both mention the time period of the latter days. So Hosea, you know the story. Uh, Hosea basically, because of uh, his adulterous wife is a perfect picture of God's love for his adulterous people, Israel. Israel continues to turn their back on God. They commit idolatry, adultery uh, with God, with other idols, uh, or on God with other, other idols. And so God tells Hosea in chapter 3 to go back to, to um, reclaim his adulterous wife as a object lesson. And so this is the explanation of the object lesson in verse 4 and 5. He says, For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. So in other words, what verse 4 is saying is that Israel is going to go into a timeout, i.e. they're going to go into exile. They're not going to have a, a ruler. They're not going to have a king or a prince. They're not going to have the ability to worship. They're going to be restrained in many ways. But verse 5, afterward, so in other words, after the exile, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. So I take that as a reference to the, the one who is in the line of David. So in other words, they are going to return to God and to be faithful to the king, um, that is instilled in the line of David for the people of Israel. And notice how the verse ends. It says, they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. So in other words, again, this, this time period, the latter days is exemplified here as the expectation for when Israel will return to the Lord their God. So again, if we put these passages together, we have the latter days being the specific time period which is given in Scripture for when the expectation of Israel's return from exile is going to take place. So you have the expectation already in Deuteronomy that Israel is going to mess up, they're going to sin, they're going to rebel and be idolatrous against God, and God is going to send them among the nations in exile. But that's not the end of the story. There is going to come a time when they are going to return. They are going to return to the Lord their God. And God will institute the kingdom. He will reign from Jerusalem. And he is going to circumcise their hearts so that they and their children are all uh, unified in their worship of God. So it's pretty exciting stuff. And now there's other things we could talk about with regard to how this takes place. Uh... I would just mention in passing, because we don't have time to develop it in full, but in Zechariah 12, uh, we have this idea that, uh, well, if, I guess if we want to talk about it uh, a little bit, I'll just mention verse 10. Um, in Zechariah 12, he says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So uh, basically, Zechariah 12.10, which is familiar to many of us, I would say we identify that uh, as well as how it's talked about a little bit in Micah and for the forgiveness of sins as the key uh, component for how Israel ends up repenting and turning back to God. So in other words, there comes a time in Israel's history where they all look upon the one whom they have pierced, which would be Jesus, obviously, and they they repent. That motivates them to to mourn, as, Ze as Zechariah talks about, and they, they do turn. And then in verse thir or chapter 13, verse 1, it says, On that day there's a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. So in other words, this is going to be the key. They will repent. They will look on the Messiah whom they have slaughtered, and they will repent, and there will be forgiveness for this nation. This is... This is why when we get to places like Romans 11, it's no surprise where Paul says uh, there will come a time where all Israel will be saved. Well, that's just what the Old Testament is talking about. 
The Old Testament talks about this restoration of the nation where it's not just one generation, it's not just uh, a few people, but the entire nation um, looks upon the, their Messiah and, and repents. Now, as a picture of what actually happens, we have Zechariah 14, which is really such a fascinating passage, uh, a great just just a great uh, example and kind of template of what's going to happen here. And so in verses 1 to 5, it gives us a template of how the nations are going to come against Jerusalem to do battle. The city itself will actually fall, and half of the city goes out into exile. Uh, and verse 3 we are told that the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem to the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half south southward. As a side note, this is why one of the reasons I love just sitting on the Mount of Olives, because, you know, this is such a integral part to what happens in the future. And then so in verse 5, it talks about how Israel is going to flee uh, through the mountains, and they're going to flee to a place called Azal, which is it's a kind of a debate as to what that actually means. And the Lord, my God, will come and all his holy ones with him. Now, this is an interesting phrase in uh, Zechariah 14.5, because Paul actually refers to it in 1 Thessalonians 3.13. Uh, which indicates that by the time Paul is writing, Zechariah 14 has not happened, but Paul is viewing it as a, as a real event that's going to take place in the future. So just put that connection down. Pretty much, uh, every commentary is going to, going to at least mention the connection between Zechariah 14 and 1 Thessalonians 3.13. And so we, we understand then that God is going to come rescue the people of Israel here. And we're told then a lot about the kingdom, about what this is going to be like. For example, verse 7, there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but evening time there shall be light. So in other words, this is going to be a just really, almost literally, a phenomenal time uh, with phenomenon, which are unknown at our at our present time. Uh, there's going to be living water flowing out of Jerusalem. And verse 9 kind of gives a great... Uh, summary of it, the Lord will be king over all the earth. And on that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So in other words, the Lord is going to be king. He's installed in Jerusalem as the ruler at this time after having rescued Israel from those who oppressed them. And you might say, great, well, this is probably talking about, you know, the second coming and the eternal state. But if you go on, that's not possible. Because as you continue to read through the passage, for example, in verse 16, it says, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. So in other words, there are going to be survivors of the nations who have done battle to Jerusalem during this time, and they're going to be required to come to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Booths. And in verse 17, it says, If any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain, and there shall be the plague which the Lord afflicts the nations with that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. So what's that saying? In fact, verse 19, I should say that explicitly. It says, this shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. So what it's saying is that there will be disobedience during this time. Now, that, that's shocking. Obviously, that can't refer to the eternal state. There is disobedience during this this time when when the Lord is reigning from Jerusalem over all the earth. That is shocking, right? So at least it's shocking if you don't have any place in your theology or eschatological framework for an intermediate kingdom. Uh, but as myself and many others would argue that this is, this is simple to understand if you hold to the fact that there is going to become an intermediate kingdom, a kingdom which spans the time period uh, in eschatology between uh, or immediately preceding the eternal state. And that seems to be a, a 
a time period where God can fulfill his promises to Israel in a, in an actual way. And also we can do justice to the prophecies, which talk about these kinds of things where Jesus is going to be reigning. The Messiah reigns from Jerusalem and there's going to be a uh, disobedience punishment that takes place uh, during the kingdom. So the old Testament, if we just stopped there, uh, talking about those Old Testament passages alone. And believe me, there are many others. I'm just for sake of time. This is already going to be a long podcast episode. But uh, I mean, come on, what do you have better to do? I mean, you're listening to this podcast anyway. So clearly, you've already shown that, you know, I'm just kidding. You you love to think deeply about things of God, and I appreciate it. So we were thinking about this from just to select Old Testament uh, passages, although there are many others, especially in the Minor Prophets and whatnot. And we could stop there, and and usually that's something that, that is acknowledged by almost every side of the eschatological spectrum, is they say, yes, if you look at just Old Testament passages, it seems to indicate that we should look forward to a physical kingdom, that we should look forward to the Messiah reigning physically from Jerusalem. There should be a restoration of Israel. That does seem to be the expectation of the Old Testament. But it's often argued that the New Testament changes that somehow. That's how it's often portrayed in, in the argumentation. Now, I want to put forward, well, a couple thoughts. On the, on the one hand, it should be acknowledged that unless something is actually uh, contradicted to what the prophetic statements are as given in the Old Testament, we shouldn't expect there to be a change with regard to that. Uh, I think that that should be readily understood. If the Old Testament talks about something, we we shouldn't assume that the Old Test or that the New Testament needs to repeat all of that. I mean, it's just assumed that that is the expectation. In fact, as Many New Testament scholars are noting now um, in the commentaries and whatnot, I think there's there's been a, a really good, uh, helpful push with regard to understanding the Second Temple uh, messianic expectation and how how that fuels even that that's a way that we can interpret the New Testament in in many helpful ways. But even uh, understanding the Old Testament gives us that insight into understanding the new better. Okay, that's that seems to be acknowledged now as a, as a foundation. But even with all that being said, uh, I would say the New Testament makes very clear that this expectation just continues. Uh, that even when we get to the New Testament, the way that things are portrayed is that there is going to come a kingdom with an actual rule involved. And so I think the easiest way to do this would just be to start in Matthew, since that's the first book, and and kind of uh, portray that. So, for example, in Matthew 19, uh, you have Peter asking Jesus, well, what are we going to have since we've left everything and followed you? And Jesus answers him in verse 28 and says, truly I say to you in the new world, and that new world there, uh, probably a, not the greatest translation. Um, some would translate it, which I think is better as the regeneration. So in other words, uh, the, Jesus is saying in the time, in the time of refreshment or the time when things are made new in the, in the, renewed world, you could say, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne. So in other words, a future expectation when the Son of Man sits on a throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that verse is, if if you take the Old Testament paradigm and apply it here, it worked, it works perfectly, where there's an expectation that the Son of Man, the Messiah, is going to rule. And notice that that's a future verb there, that this is this is going to take place, a, a, a future idea, I should say, uh, where you have this, uh, the Son of Man is not currently sitting on the glorious throne, but he's going to be sitting on the glorious throne. And when that takes place, then the disciples also are going to sit on thrones, administering judgment. Well, when is that going to take place? Within the context of Jesus talking to his disciples, they would have only understood this in a context of a real restoration for the people of Israel uh, with a real Messiah ruling from Jerusalem. I mean, 
no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no qualifications here, no uh, rearrangements of their expectations. That's It's just given straightforward, and so that would be their expectation. Well, as you go through, uh, there's many ways that Matthew portrays uh, the movements that are going on in uh, Israel's history. One thing that I thought would be helpful to point out is that in Matthew 21, you have Jesus giving uh, a very interesting parable, uh, starting in verse 33, and he goes uh, about um, 10 verses there. And it's a parable about a master of the house who plants a vineyard, he puts a fence around it, and he goes off into another country. Again, you have this idea where the master or the the one who is going to rule goes away for a time. So that, so in other words, you know, there's, there's a, in between time, um, an expectation of, uh, return in some sense. And so, uh, the parable talks about how the master sends, uh, his servants and they're killed. They exemplify the prophets. And then he sends the son and the, the tenants, the ones who are taking care of the vineyard while the master is gone, say, let's kill the son and then we can have the inheritance. And so, again, this is exemplifying the Jewish leadership, the fact that they killed the prophets, that they ultimately are going to kill, kill the son, the representative of God. And so because of that, uh, basically Jesus asked them, well, what's the master going to do? And so in verse 41, the, Pharisees answer and say, well, he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give them the fruits in their seasons. And so Jesus affirms that that's true. And in verse 43, he says, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So in other words, if we're taking Matthew just on its on a, on its own terms, the book of Matthew on its own terms, uh, what Jesus seems to be saying here is that the kingdom of God, which has been offered to this generation, is taken away and it's going to be given to a generation that is worthy of it, that is producing its fruits. In other words, uh, the generation which fits the definition of Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 30, the, gener- the generation that seeks the Lord with their with their whole heart that has been completely circumcised. The generation of Zechariah 12, which, which looks upon, uh, which looks upon the one whom they have pierced and mourns. So in other words, because Israel's continuing in their rebellion, God, uh, is going to give the kingdom to a subsequent generation. So uh, another people producing its fruits. And so now I should say too, I, I want to, uh, fairly represent others with this is that um, some people uh, have said that this is a switcheroo of sorts where God takes the kingdom away from Israel and gives it to the church. And that has been a way that people uh, um, interpret this passage, but really you can't interpret Matthew that way at all. Matthew is, is essentially Jewish. And I mean, essentially by the, uh, by the very literal meaning of the term is that Matthew is in and out uh, very, very Jewish in, in how it's interpreting. And it's, it's very, very difficult, uh, to interpret this phrase as a reference to Gentile community or anything like that. Uh, the most natural way to interpret Matthew's understanding of this would be a subsequent Jewish generation, which would make sense. And that fits with, again, our Old Testament paradigm. If we're, if we presuppose the understanding of a, entire Jewish generation that repents and uh, submits to the Lord, has regenerated hearts, then this fits with that. And Jesus is just saying, this is not the generation. Um, it's to come still. And so notice the kingdom of God is linked there with a future uh, generation of Israel at that point. Now, as we continue on in Matthew, one of uh, Dr. Vlock who I do hope to get on the podcast at some point soon. One of his favorite verses with regard to the kingdom is in Matthew twenty five thirty one, And I just really appreciate some of the work that he's done on this verse. Uh, you can definitely look look up his blog and, and see how he's uh, addressed some of this. But it's just a short verse. But in talking about eschatological matters in Matthew 24 and 25, it really jumps out at you. In verse 31, it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. 
So in other words, it's it's 100% saying that there's a delay between um, when the Son of Man executes his kingdom rule, i.e. when he sits on his throne, uh, and the immediate time period. So in other words, when the Son of Man goes to heaven, is he reigning on his glorious throne? Well, not according to this passage, because according to this passage, Matthew 25, 31, it says when the Son of Man comes in his glory with the angels, that would be at the at the very end, then he's going to sit on his glorious throne. And at that point, he institutes his kingdom. As we see in verses 32 and following, he gathers all the nations. He separates peoples from one another. He judges them. That would fit with Zechariah 14. So in other words, Matthew 25, 31 is basically giving the Zechariah 14 time period is that the Son of Man is going to come in glory and he's going to sit on his throne at that time. So we could do a true or false question here. Is Jesus on his glorious throne right now? Well, according to this verse, the answer would be false. I guess I didn't make that a true false question. But either way, uh, you get the point. So according to this verse, the Son of Man is not on his glorious throne, i.e. the throne of David, the one uh, the one which is going to be centered in Jerusalem as part of the kingdom. Christ is not on that, but he will be later. He will be when he comes again. He will rule from Jerusalem. So we walk through Matthew. I would say Matthew is very strong in a Jewish expectation of a kingdom and the messianic reign of Christ to come. Now, just a couple more passages. I know we've already gone uh, quite a ways, but I want to try to be thorough, so I'm just going to wrap up with two more pertinent passages. So in the book of Acts, this is a, a strong go-to for those who, who teach a future kingdom idea, and that's because in Acts 1-3, the resurrected Christ presents himself to the disciples. In verse 3, it says, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Okay, so this is this is great because Jesus has been glorified. He he's been raised from the dead. There is there's no more shrouded mystery about what the expectation of Christ's life is going to be because he's already conquered death. And so he's actually explaining the kingdom of God to the disciples for 40 days. Pretty amazing. This is the greatest teaching on the kingdom of God that has ever happened in the history of the world. You have it from the Messiah himself talking about what's going to happen in the kingdom. So you would think that the disciples would probably understand a little bit about the kingdom at this point. And so in verse 6, they ask the question, when is this going to take place? And notice how they ask it. They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, for somebody like myself or others who believe in a future for Israel and whatnot, this is really easy to understand. The disciples are just taking the Old Testament paradigm and they're asking, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this point? Are you going to uh, revive the people? Are you going to circumcise their hearts? Are you going to restore this, this kingdom to the people of Israel? Now, again, remember, Jesus has just talked to the disciples for 40 uh, days about the kingdom of God. So it's unlikely. I think you would be really in dire straits to argue that they misunderstood the kingdom of God at this point. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't go there. I know some people do say that, uh, trying to spiritualize this idea or say that the disciples were were wrong. Now, notice in, in Jesus' response, he doesn't say, uh, you sillies, the kingdom is, is just a spiritual concept which doesn't exist, or it's, it's a spiritual reality, or Israel doesn't have a special place in the kingdom. That's not at all how he responds. He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So in other words, he's talking, he, he, he basically doesn't say, no, you're asking the wrong question. No, he just says, it's not for you to know when. It's not for you to know when. And so in reality, when we think through these questions, uh, they, they're not off basis. There's no reason to think that they are. Jesus just responds saying, I'm not going to tell you what the timing is on these things. And that that's helpful. 
Now, as we go, I mean, that in and of itself is very strong evidence. I would also say uh, Acts 3 is really strong evidence uh, of an expectation for the kingdom. Uh, I've done a complete podcast on Acts 3, 19 through 21 in and of itself, but just uh, by summary, when Peter is preaching to the Jews, he basically tells them to repent so that they might have forgiveness of sins and that the Verse 20, times of refreshment might come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. So in other words, he links the the coming of Christ with the repentance of Israel at that point. And I, if you say, well, how does that work? It works if you remember the Old Testament paradigm for the entire nation of Israel. When they repent, that's when the kingdom is instituted. So Peter is just picking up on that in verse 20, and he's saying, repent that this time might come, that the Christ may return for us. And so, you know, I, I have no other way to understand that. Uh, it works perfectly with the Old Testament paradigm. Uh, the apostles are preaching the exact same picture of that. It's, it's very convincing. Uh, it's, it's very cogent. It, it's, it's a linear strain that works from Old Testament to New Testament. There's, there's no major distinction between that. It's, it's a unified thread. Now, so we've gone through quite a bit, right? And and I just want to say uh, at the outset that many times people who believe in, in a future kingdom, a millennial kingdom, are often accused of building a system on one passage. That's Revelation 20. Now, you'll notice I haven't even talked about Revelation 20 at this point. And really, it's, it's silly, and, it, and this is because a lot of people don't actually interact with academic dispensationalists and... Uh, it's, it's kind of silly because Revelation 20 really mainly only provides the time frame of expectation. But the theology of a kingdom, an intermediate kingdom, is built on the entirety of scripture. Uh, Revelation 20 just comes along and provides us with the, the when this is going to take place and how long. What's the extent of this kingdom going to be? Well, it's going to be a thousand years, according to Revelation 20. But, Without Revelation 20, there would still be a very clear expectation of a kingdom, a restoration of Israel. All those things are very clearly taught in Scripture, and it's just Revelation 20 which gives the extent of that kingdom before the eternal state and how all that is going to work together. So I hope this is helpful because, you know, I think I think a lot of times... We get lazy in, in thinking through these things. Sometimes we try to start in the New Testament and we look at some, and there are, there are passages which, uh, I think admittedly, uh, could be, could be brought against some of the things that I'm saying, um, and say, well, how would you deal with this passage or this passage? And that's good. That's, that's the right thing to do. I'm presenting just a positive case for how to think through the kingdom theme in scripture and how it shows that there's a distinction between Israel and the church and that there's a special expectation for a, a restored ethnic kingdom, a geopolitical entity called Israel, where the Messiah will be ruling from Jerusalem. N literal nations will be uh, under that banner coming to Jerusalem to, to seek counsel, to have their disputes decided. That's what the scriptures teach. And so I think that we can we can acknowledge those those difficulties and work through those for for sure that's helpful to do but at the same time you know I I don't think there's much mystery involved with just the clear expectation development of the kingdom theme in scripture that this kingdom is going to take place in the future when Israel as a nation repents Paul talks about that when all Israel will be saved and the kingdom itself is going to have a special role with the people of Israel. The Messiah will be reigning from the location of Jerusalem. It's going to take place during a renewal of the earth, which makes complete sense since when the Messiah was here temporarily prior, basically he banished all sickness and death from his interactions, which showed his, his great power. So that will be even on a higher level during the kingdom. And so all of that is just a great reality, which we can rejoice at. We can, we can, uh, be in awe of. And really one of the, one of the things I didn't mention, but should be brought forward too, is that thinking through these issues, uh, really should give us just a, a tremendous awe and 
opportunity to glorify God and, and desire his, his will to be done with regard to these things. In any case, even if you disagree, I look forward to hearing from you. You can always reach out via my website or through email. Uh, you can visit my website, peteryuman.com, and see some of the articles that I've written about this issue as well as others. There's, I think, maybe a handful, four or five articles on the kingdom that I've uh, written there. Uh, you can also visit the seminary's website at shepherds.edu. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.